Welcome to Worship at St. Mark's. It's so good to have you all here today. I'm not going to go through any of the announcements today. I think you can read them in the bulletin for yourself. Just want to talk about that this is a very special day. It's bittersweet because we are celebrating Pastor Finch and 31 years of ministry with us. And we are also saying goodbye to him, which is difficult to think about him not being around St. Mark's anymore. But we're also so happy for him that he can move on to this phase of life of having leisure time and traveling and things like that. But it's hard to say goodbye. So we hope you will come for um, the celebration party at noon today. We will have lots of fans and lots of ice water and um, there will be fried chicken and your side dishes and cake and at 1.30 uh, presentation in the fellowship hall. We have table, we'll have tables all over inside and outside so hope you'll come. Please stand for the confession and forgiveness. to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for Jesus' sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please turn and face the cross.
seated for the Alleluia Choir's offering. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated, Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boost, I mean, boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all of this? What is the wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deeds of wonder there 
except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. The Gospel of the Lord. They say that a sermon should have an excellent beginning and a great ending, and they should be as close close together as possible, (laughs) especially when it's hot. But preachers have so much to say, and that's a little the way I feel today. Preaching isn't such an easy job, you know. The parallel gospel text to this one says the first time that Jesus tried it, the good church people grabbed him and they tried to pull him out of the pulpit and throw him over a cliff. Really. So in case you ever tried that with me, I took karate lessons. (laughs) Part of Jesus' problem in his first sermon was that he tried to preach in his hometown. The Gospel text today says a prophet is without honor in his or her own hometown. And it says that Jesus could do no miracles there in his hometown of Nazareth. And the people from other close by little towns were known to have said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So when I came back to my hometown from Minneapolis, to take the call to St. Mark's, I knew I could be headed for trouble. Instead, how gracious you have been to me. I can't imagine serving a better congregation with smarter and more supportive people. Good looking too. (laughs) Although I'm sure a few of you have asked yourself, didn't he go to Rogers High School? Can anything good come out of Rogers? <laughs> and when Aunt Fennessy sings in the offertory uh, about laying your burdens down, I am not laying you people down as a burden. The last thing. But the text is clear. The hometown people didn't much believe in Jesus or give him any authority. But I'd like to widen the issue of this text this morning and talk about the fact that we don't seem to honor anyone anymore. Everyone in authority has been knocked off of their proverbial pedestals. What do we lose as a community and as a nation by no longer having authority figures? What does it mean to live in a time when the one we are most apt to listen to is the one that makes us laugh. The research has been done. If I am funny, your attention span for this 12-minute sermon will be seven minutes. If I am not funny, your attention span will be three. I'm shooting for four. No one listens to authority figures anymore, and it's mainly because, like the hometown prophet, we know them too well. We live in an age where everyone knows everything about everyone else, or we can find it. You know if I practice what I preach, or you can find out. Even the Holy Father in Rome, if you have been following the news, has to fight for his authority these days, as American billionaires with interests in fossil fuels try to discredit his new encyclical on the environment. And I feel sorry for the Catholic presidential candidates. They have to choose between billionaire money and the one that their church says has supreme, infallible authority. Not anymore. It means we don't have authority figures anymore. But let's look at this issue biblically. And if we do, we find that we are to honor the office, not the person. And this is made very clear in the Old Testament. It is the prophetic office you honor, not the prophet, hometown or not. 
Some of the Old Testament prophets who have books named after them slept with prostitutes. Amos even sang her praises in the book that he wrote in the Bible. King David led a very promiscuous lifestyle, even by modern standards. And yet the New Testament goes to great length to prove that Jesus descended from David. It wasn't about David. It was about the office of king. And here's what Jesus said about all of this. Practice what they preach, not what they do. Jesus knew the frailty of those who hold respected office. Practice what they preach, not what they do. I'm so glad Jesus said that. How good was I at practicing what I preached to you for over 31 years? I don't want you to know. The church dealt with this issue many centuries ago because there's always been a clergy problem. The doctrine has been taught since the fourth century that the validity of the sacraments has nothing to do with the pastor or the priest who administers them. It's called the efficacy of the sacraments, separated from those who hold the pastoral office. Am I going to get you to four minutes? You better listen. I might say something funny. But I am so glad that I served my 44 years of ministry in a denomination that makes it clear that we are all sinners here. And the pastor is not the model of the godly life any more than you are. And that there is not one person with less sin than another. That is a core basic tenet of Lutheranism. Lutherans don't expect their pastors to sin less than they do. It's not good theology. Of course, the irony of our text, and all these texts have irony, is they tried to throw off a cliff the one preacher in history who did practice what he preached the one who is the authority figure of authority figures. He asks us to forgive our enemies, and that is the hardest thing of all things to do. He forgave his enemies, even while they were crucifying him. He tells us to pray and to trust his father. He did try to talk the father out of the crucifixion, but what did he say in the end? Thy will be done, not mine. He said to be inclusive, even if the religious people don't like it. He hung out with prostitutes and questionable characters and people who were not very religious. He said the poor are blessed, and he lived among them. This is the one, the only one, who has practiced what he preached and lived by the truths that he taught. This is the one whose message was rejected the first time he climbed into a pulpit. Sometimes visitors come to St. Mark's and they hear a gospel that is far too inclusive for their tastes. And they tell me at the door, I pretend that I am hard of hearing. What an honor it has been to serve as your pastor in this wonderfully inclusive church. Mine says here, don't get emotional. Why do we stand every Sunday when the words of Jesus are read from the gospel? Why do some Bibles <clears throat> print the words of Jesus in red letters? 
because this is the true authority for our lives. The gospel is always preached by unworthy pastors, but it is the gospel and it is the most important thing you will ever hear. And I really didn't take karate lessons. <laughs> Amen. Pastor Finch asked me to tell you that he wants you to be seated for the hymn. Would you stand and join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered by the Holy Spirit and fed by the Word, 
we come together as the people of God to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Gracious God, we pray for the church throughout the world that you guide it in all its endeavors and inspire it to proclaim the gospel with boldness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the earth and sky, seas and deserts, plant and animal habitats, that your good creation thrive and flourish, and we do our part to make that happen. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for leaders eager to show mercy, that your justice spreads to all nations, and that all may celebrate freedom from oppression, especially in countries torn by religious strife. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those who live with chronic pain or disease that leaves no outward sign, for those who grieve, and for all those who are sick or hospitalized or in harm's way, especially Jim, Christy, Bernadine, Amy, Pam, Thelma, Amy, Darwin, Cody, Linda, Todd, Don, Charlene, Kim, Taya, Brandon, Elijah, Blaine, Naomi, Tom, Stacy, Emma, Celine, Rick, and Tate. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this assembly, for those who are visiting, those who are traveling, and those who cannot be with us today, that all experience Christ's presence and peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We thank you for the work and witness of your servant, Richard. Bless him in this time of transition. Guide him day by day of that to which you are now calling him. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We remember with gratitude the saints who endured persecutions for the sake of Christ. Uphold us also with your all-sufficient grace until we join them at heavenly banquet. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, loving God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the grace of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share Christ's peace one with another.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and all places offer thanks and praise to you. O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love. Let our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer. In the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for them all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread so that your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life, your son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever.
We commune this morning by way of intinction. We ask that you come by way of the center aisle, receive the host into your open hand and reserve to dip in the cup as the words are spoken and then return by the side aisles. There are gluten-free wafers that will be present in the middle and know that these are the gifts of God. For you, the people of God, come, for all are welcome to the table. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <sighs>
in peace, serve the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, God.